Ladies, I was so pumped about the first message. Did anyone cry? Yes? I, I, I like had some tears in my eyes. I had a few people I was talking to. Well, I don't want to make this another introduction or a long one because uh, Mo did such a phenomenal job, and I f hate that the bell rang on such an awesome message. So I just um, want to get really quickly right into Mo. So let me just do a quick prayer, and then we're going to bring Mo right back on out here. All right, let me pray, ladies. Lord, just lift up our spirits. What a joy it is that we can just all be together here as ladies and that you can just be really present in our lives. And I just pray that we find our identity through you, Lord, that we see the blessings every day that you've given us. And I pray we just go and seek you. And I pray as most speaks, you give her the spirit just to attack this room and fulfill this room and to let just Satan run away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's give another welcome for Mo. Thank you. Oh, okay, here's what we need to do to start off. Look at your neighbor and just be like, you know what, girl, about to talk about sex. Just do that. And get like... <laughs> okay, y'all are saying way more than that. You're like, I don't really know, Karen. It seems really stressful. And what do you think? And what do I think? And no, no, no. We just got to get the, the, the jitters out because I think oftentimes we think, especially as women, this type of conversation is kind of taboo. Like it's kind of hushed and we push it under the rug or we keep it, you know, quietly behind closed doors or we don't really think it has a place in sort of the Christian narrative or what we as believers would necessarily talk about. And so we've kind of bought into the feeling that like, oh my gosh, sex, like we don't talk about sex and, and we'll just figure it out. And I definitely don't want to talk to my parents about sex and, and maybe I'll just learn from, from Carol, my 13-year-old friend, what she knows. And it's like, we just don't really know what source to turn to. There's probably not a single 13-year-old on planet Earth named Carol. But at one time there had to be, because there seems like a lot of grown women named Carol. Point is, it's just neither here nor there. The point is, we are a generation, by and large, confused about sex and unsure about what to say or how to say it or what we think or what we believe because we don't have a sourced definition for it. And because... Honestly, we as the body of Christ have just been quiet about it for far too long. You see, what's interesting is that I think one of the greatest weapons the enemy is wielding against the daughters of God, which we talked about earlier, you are a daughter, a warrior for the kingdom if you've placed your faith in Jesus and been filled by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, then God is fashioning you up as a woman made in his image with purpose and with power written into her days. But the greatest weapon the enemy has sort of wielded is with all things sex, all things sexuality, all things physicality, confusing the daughters of God about it. There are a million voices that have a million different takes and a million different perspectives on all things sex. And that has been, I think, the, the enemy's greatest tool is that we are not sure where to turn our ears. But when I look at the living, breathing word of God, I find an incredible, never-changing, never-failing source of truth that has a lot to say about sex. Now understand, I'm talking about this stuff truly as a pilgrim, not a preacher, because I learned every hard lesson, every hard way when it came to this stuff. And I'll share a little bit of that testimony with you guys. But what I love is that no matter what my backstory looked like, when Jesus intersected it, he rewrites our future. He rewrites our stories to come. And when I look at the word of God, I see God talk a lot about sex. I see a very clear, sourced, absolute truth that we can turn to and we can grow and we can learn in. And as women, especially, it's essential that we learn about these things. It is essential that we talk about these things. It is essential that we understand these things so that we can be our healthiest, most whole, most healed, most unobstructed warriors for the kingdom. So we've got to talk about sex. 
And what I love is that to talk about it is to actually look more like the one who created it. We think sex is taboo to talk about, but you guys, sex was God's invention. Sex was a gift from God, a unifying gift. Why is that funny? Someone's like, oh my God, God knows. (laughs) Oh my him, he knows about it. He made it! Sex is God's invention. In fact, the first conversation God ever had with Adam and Eve with humans involved sex. We're like, wait a second, Shelby. Where is that? Leviticus? No, it's right there in Genesis. You guys, we talked about it in the last talk, but God's first conversation with man spoke about two things. Two things were married right from the get-go. God said you were made in his image. He said, be fruitful. So he's speaking inherent identity over you. He's saying, you are made in my image. I have plans for you. I have purpose for you. I know every hair I knit on your head. I want you to be fruitful, to be productive, to be constructive, to use the gifts and tools I've given you in an undistracted way to work for the kingdom, to rule over the world, to be effective where you are. He says, be fruitful, and he marries it and gives sexual instruction and says, and multiply. So he's speaking into the covenant of Adam and Eve. He's saying, know your inherent identity as an image-bearing creation of God and follow my sexual instruction. These two things are unified. They are good. They are a blessing. They are a gift. But what happened when, Eve, when the enemy tempted Eve in the garden? Eve chose to choose what was best for herself. What she wanted to do, even despite what God had said, God had given very clear instruction and Eve chose that maybe God was withholding something from her. And you guys, this is what happens when sexual sin enters our narratives. It's just like Eve, we get tempted, we get tested, and we choose to choose for ourselves. But what is so harmful about sexual sin in particular is that when sexual sin enters the equation, it takes these two things that were married together, our inherent worth, our good, bountiful gift of sexual instruction. We decide we're going to choose what is best for us and our design sexually, and it rips these two things apart. And what does sexual sin and struggles become in our life? They become the very thing we use to try to find what was already spoken over us. We want to feel loved. We want to feel seen. We want to feel known. We want to feel desired. We want to feel valuable. It was already spoken over us by the king of all kings. He gave great instruction when it came to keeping ourselves pure, to living lives of holiness and godliness, to obeying his commands. But we decided, but maybe I just, because this boy kind of likes me, or because I saw this on the computer screen and it tempted me, or because I felt this and it worked for me, we decide I want to choose here, God, what I think is best. And sexual sin then has an unbelievable way to wrap itself around us and own us, and we then leverage it to try to find our identity. This is the bigger picture of brokenness that is kind of pulsing through our culture right now. And y'all, our culture, oh my goodness, it's taken sex and it's cheapened it, it's twisted it, it's perverted it, it's worshipped it, it's taken what was a gift from God and it's exalted and worshipped the created gift rather than the creator. But look around, too, at the same culture that's like, sex can be casual, and, and y'all, when I say sex, I'm including everything that falls under the gambit of giving our bodies away in this way, giving our minds, our hearts to impure things. Culture says, feel it out for yourself. Test the waters, run the rent, do the maze, test, car, test drive the car before you buy it. It's necessary in a dating relationship. Your boyfriend's kind of pushing you to go to this space, then this space. Just go with it. Just roll with it. Everybody else is doing it. This is the culture that says, figure sex out for yourself and kind of write your own rules. And this is the same culture that is hashtag me tooing. It's a wounded, hurting culture that is sexually confused. The... the, the, the Out of wedlock, pregnancy rates skyrocketed. The STI, STD rates skyrocketed. People hurt people in this room who have given pieces of themselves away sexually trying to navigate these waters. Wounded. Wounded. This was so my story, and this is why I'm so passionate about reclaiming sex for the glory of God. 
Because God's gifts are never meant to be burdensome. They're never meant to be shame-filled. They're never meant to be confusing in how to navigate. But this is often what sexual stuff and stuff as young women developing becomes. It becomes really confusing, murky water. But I love 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5. It says God's will, his desire for you, is to be holy. So stay away from sexual sin. Then each of you will control her own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do, do not know God and his ways. So what it's saying is that God's greatest desire is we would be obedient so that we would be set apart so that we could be fruitful, productive, constructive, undistracted, not worrying about that nudie that you sent getting spread around in text to different people. Now, all the things of the sexual sin, they're all distraction. They become distraction to pull us away from our purpose. God says, no, my will is for you to be holy, for you to know me, draw near to me, be obedient, and see what I will do with your life. But what happens, you guys, when we don't understand these foundational things, which I didn't, gosh, especially as a young girl, when we don't understand these foundational things, we get real confused and temptation and shame and sin enter in real quickly. So here's a little bit of my story, and I won't make you do a show of hands of who can resonate with what part. Um, but I was raised up in the church, like I said, and when it came to all things sexuality or sex, I remember, um, oh, this is so awesome. I remember when I was about nine years old, I was doing a school project. Mind you, this is still a great mystery. No scientist has ever figured it out. But I was doing a school project on snakes, and I could not figure out for the life of me how snakes had sex. I still don't know. I don't think there's an answer. I couldn't figure it out. I remember going downstairs to my mom's room, and she had this little love seat in her room, and I, we sat down because I needed to ask her this question about the project, and somehow the conversation rolled into talking about sex. And mind you, I'm nine, and already at that point in my life, I had had an older neighbor take me out to a fort by a, a little creek in our neighborhood and tell me everything she knew about sex. I, I didn't ask, Natalie. I don't care. <laughs> it was like... But she told me everything she thought she knew. Natalie was my encyclopedia when it came to sex, and Natalie was just about three years older than me. She had somehow been exposed to something or taught something. And so already I'd been exposed to that, and already I had opened the truck door of my dad's truck Earlier that year, and a playing card had fallen out of just kind of wads of papers behind the driver's seat. And I bent down to pick up this playing card and stuff it back in, and it was a novelty poker card that was porn in my dad's truck that I was exposed to. I told y'all we were going to get real. What, y'all think I was going to keep it safe up here? I don't have time for that. <laughs> you kidding me? Right now, you guys, the average age of exposure to pornography is nine years old. That's the average age. That means kids even younger are being exposed. That means probably the vast majority in here at some point have come across it when you hit the wrong hashtag on Twitter. <laughs> Legit. I don't know how these companies think to weave these things into hashtag. I'm like, oh, hashtag cotton candy. What in the? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's too much. But the point is, I remember, I will never forget the feeling when I looked at that and saw it as a child and it seared something on my soul. I immediately knew that was wrong. I couldn't figure out why it was in my dad's truck when my mom was right inside the house. And so when I came down to my mom's room to ask about the science project, I was coming in with a lot of thoughts already on the table at nine years old. A lot of exposure already on the table at nine years old. Because you see that first bit of exposure to sexual perversion in porn and what my friends were telling me, you guys, it starts as feeling, oh, gross. And I think if we did an honest show of hands in here, that, that shame quickly kind of turns into curiosity. When our flesh rules our lives and that's what's defining things for us, that curiosity then led me to seek those things out more and more, to try to find more of what I'd seen, to try to figure out these feelings in my body. This is the human experience. So when I came to ask my mom about this stuff, I'm sure I was probably saying words that if my child ever said to me, I would just 
maybe have a heart attack and fall out. But I was just telling her everything I knew about sex and couldn't figure out how snakes had sex. And my mom kind of pumped the brakes on the conversation and she said, started to explain to me in the simplest way what God desired. And, and what she explained was that God desired we be virgins until we were married, that she and my dad were both virgins when they were married. And before I even let my mom continue the conversation to speak any depth into that, I triumphantly stood up at nine years old and said, then mother, I too will be a virgin until I am married. And I marched out of the room like I had just made the proclamation of my life. And to be totally honest, I think a lot of the times we talk a lot about virginity and we fail to actually talk about purity. And so virginity kind of becomes our works-based answer to a life surrender question. You see, around all things sexuality, what God asks is that we would love him with all our hearts, all our minds, all our soul, all our strength. And we usually say, well, let me just try to give you some semi-good behavior. This roots back to him searching our hearts, the desire for heart transformation, not just behavior modification. Because you guys, I started to walk waving this vain virgin banner and that was fine for a few years until like the end of middle school hit and early high school hit and temptation kind of actually practically entered the equation and these things became a little more desirable to me and my exposure had expanded and then suddenly, because I didn't know the truth and the fullness of what God said about sex, my question became, okay, so how far then is too far? Show of hands, who's asked that question? No, you don't really have to raise your hand. People are like, I will never. How far <laughs> is too far becomes our question when we see sexuality and all things sex in the simplified version of like, this is right, this is wrong, don't do this, don't do that. I need to do this in order to measure up. I need to do that. What happens when we begin to give works-based answers is that we miss the greater call to purity, the question on our heart that should be, oh God, how close can I draw near to you? Not how far is too far, how far can I press the envelope, but God, how close can I draw near to you? This is what God would desire of our lives because a life lived in purity a byproduct becomes virginity or becomes abstinence. A life lived in purity, pure thoughts, pure mind, pure heart, pure words. The overflow is our actions, but the heart condition is what compels it. And the love of a God who knows what's best for us is what compels our obedience. But I didn't know any of this. I didn't know a bit of it. So I started to navigate through figuring things out on my own around late middle school, early high school. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing a lot. Testing the waters, trying things out, doing this with somebody, and then I guess the next time you have to go further, right? And you have to go further, and we can't ever rewind back to where we were. Even though I felt conviction on my heart, I knew I didn't love it. I knew I didn't even like it. I knew I was confused, but we just get on this train and it starts moving a million miles an hour forward when we allow sexual sin in and we give it a foothold. So then college came and I told you I lost my dad and what will happen is that adversity and grief will trigger us further into these things and sexual sin became the salve I tried to use to kind of heal the pain inside, to numb the pain inside sought every sin-sized piece to fill the God-sized hole in my heart, gave people pieces of my body in hopes that they would give me their heart. And I gave more and more of myself away, but I still waved my virgin banner because I hadn't gone all the, all the, all the way. And I pushed the envelope, still struggling with pornography and actually beginning to act out on the things I was seeing. You see, guys, the eye is the lamp into our body. That's what Scripture says. What we set before our eyes determines to a great degree what we believe in our hearts and our spirits and our souls, where our thoughts go. So I started doing more and more, acting out these things, thinking these women must be the picture of beauty or value. This is what the guys obviously like, and so I need to do these things to feel like a powerful female. And before I realized it, I woke up one morning after a night out in college. This was pre-Jesus. These were BC days before Christ. I woke up... <laughs> 
You can use that. I think it's hilarious. I woke up one morning, and I was replaying and recalling the night before in my head and what all had happened, and it struck me all of a sudden I had been involved with a married man. I had adultery written over my story. Unknowingly, in a state of partying, somebody had said he was separated, somebody said divorce, I didn't really care, I wasn't all that interested in him, and yet by the end of the night, things had happened, and suddenly I was an adulteress. How could I, the well-meaning, good, churched girl, I was smart, I was a competitive athlete, I'd known a lot about God, I had, had, still could wave the virgin banner, but you guys, how I, I could wave the virgin banner and yet had promiscuity and adultery underneath it. So if virginity was the sole thing I was hoping counted for something, yet I knew nothing of purity, how much a fool was I? And I almost got nauseous realizing how far I had gone and how deep I had rationalized and suddenly where my life was. Oh, but the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I will never forget when I came to know Jesus in that car accident that I told you about. It was just a short while after that morning that I had woken up. And as I recovered from that, as I put my faith in Jesus and started following him and started trying to figure things out of what it meant and what truth was and what I should do and what I shouldn't do and who I needed to avoid and how I needed to care more about my heart and my purity than I did about pleasing the guys around me or the other girls who like to party or whatever it may be, what I began to learn was the first thing he was really starting to stir up in me when I came to know Jesus and cared about what God desired for me, the first things he was starting to stir up in me was my sexual baggage, my sexual sin, and it was uncomfortable. I didn't like it. I didn't love it. I didn't want to think about A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. I didn't want to think about the list a mile long that I couldn't even recall of all the people. I didn't want to think about the ways I had talked the talk but not walked the walk, yet he drummed these things up in me, and y'all, it drew me straight to understanding when we look at the Samaritan woman at the well. You see, do you all know this story, the Samaritan woman? Literally no one. Okay, cool, good, good, good. I'm like, who's your Bible class teacher? Okay, so the Samaritan woman at the well, by all accounts, was a whore. This is a woman who's come out to the well to draw water in the middle of the day so she wouldn't even have to be around people. This is a woman with a reputation the mile long. And this Samaritan woman is at the well and Jesus encounters her. And y'all, Jesus is a little bit sassy. I don't know how you read scripture, but I love seeing the layers of Jesus. And sometimes he's just like, he's just sassy. So he's with the woman at the well and he says to her, first he speaks to her, which blows her mind because that breaks through every barrier of what she thought was normal or socially acceptable. And guess what? Jesus doesn't care about what's normal or what's socially acceptable. He wants you, and he's chasing after you. And he speaks to this woman, and he says, um, can you draw me some water? And she's like, why are you talking to me? He says, well, go and get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus is like, I know. <laughs> Son of man, I know you don't. <laughs> You've had five husbands, and the man you're married to now, or the man you're living with now, isn't even one of them. Jesus drums up every bit of this woman's reputation and sexual sin right to the surface at meeting her. And she is like, how would you know these things about me? If I were the Samaritan woman, I would have probably taken off running in shame and in guilt. That's not true. How would you know that? You're not even from around here. What are you talking about? That isn't me. You must be confusing me with somebody else. Jesus, I don't want to have to wrestle through all the guys I've been involved with. I don't want to have to wrestle with the, 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 the struggles in my heart of hating what I see before the mirror and hoping somebody will give it worth. I don't want to have to wrestle with the temptations I've felt and that I've caved to sometimes when I've been alone. I don't want to wrestle with this stuff, but that was not the Samaritan woman's response. You see, Jesus drummed up all of her sexual baggage in front of her, her confusion, her pain, her shame. She says, how could you know all these things about me? You must be the Messiah. He said, oh, if you only knew who I was, you would take living water and you would never thirst again. You guys, this is the woman. This is us 
who's walked the same tired trail back and forth every day to the well to fill up on more water, to bring it back, to hope that it quenches the angst in her. This is us who are in the world, who are trying things, who are experimenting, who are exploring, and we know it's wrong. We know we've been hurt. We know that boyfriend didn't stick around, and that was fleeting, and so we come back to the well, and we need something to tell our soul that we're worth it, that that, that we're not too far gone. We need something to tell us there's hope, and we fill up, and we're like, okay, I can do this. I can head back into this place, and then social media comes into the equation. And it's got its own ball game of temptations and confusions. And we want the likes and we post the bikini pic and we hope that maybe it stirs something in somebody and then it doesn't get what we wanted. And so we head back to the well. Tell me I'm valuable. Tell me I'm worth something. And we're back and forth and back and forth. Oh, but the Samaritan woman, Jesus said, I know everything about you. He drums up her filth and in the face of her filth, he stays and he offers her living water. I know what can quench your thirst. Hashtag thirsty generation needs a good Jesus Gatorade at this point. (laughs) And do you know what I love about the Samaritan woman? The whore at the well, the woman with the sexual backstory, the first person in the Gospels that Jesus gives explicit permission to to go and evangelize. Like, wait a second, that's not when he started his ministry. No, but Jesus has been performing miracles. He's been healing. He's been raising from the dead. Just a Tuesday for him. But if you look at the scriptures, everything he does, he says, don't tell anyone what I've done for you. Now, don't say what I've done. He is, he is meticulous in the release of his ministry. But the first person that Jesus gives explicit permission to, to go, tell him who I am, is the whore at the well, the female with the sexual baggage. He says, I see you. I know you. I love you. I know every page of your past, and I call you redeemed. So go tell them who I am. Go tell them I'm the Messiah. Go tell them I love you. Go tell them I write your reputation. I write the banner over your life. And no matter if you're in this room and you've never touched anybody or thought a perverse thought, praise God for your pure heart, or whether you were in this room and you slept with your boyfriend last weekend, he says, I have a new banner to write over your life. It's called redeemed. You are mine and I am yours. You're not just here, you are his. And y'all, the Samaritan woman runs back to her village and hundreds come to believe in response to her faithfulness. This is the Jesus I met in scripture when I came out of my confusion and my struggles. I saw the God of Rahab. You know, Rahab the prostitute who God used in the bloodline and lineage of Jesus Christ. I saw Jesus with the Samaritan woman. I saw Jesus with the adulteress to be stoned, caught red-handed. Some of y'all right now are caught red-handed in your hearts before God in sexual sin or in struggles. Some of y'all want to melt into your seat because I talked about porn and you've never talked about that before and you can't believe another female has struggled with that because you do too. Y'all, the greatest weapon of the enemy is to keep you silenced with shame. That is his greatest weapon Sexual sin, more so than so many other things, carries this weight of shame and guilt. And he wants to keep your lips sealed as a result, thinking no one else around you is struggling. No one else is dealing with these things. No one else has seen that. No one else keeps coming back to that, especially no other females. Y'all, come on. In 2016 alone, one calendar year on one pornographic website, there are hundreds of thousands One year on one website, we as a people consumed 4.6 billion hours of porn. That is 524,000 years, or 17,000 complete lifetimes in one year on one website. If we are so naive as to think that sexual perversion, that this battle we are fighting is just a struggle for unsaved males, then we're as naive as they come. Sexual perversion is affecting men, it's affecting women, it's affecting children. It is an onslaught attack from the enemy. But I see a room of female warriors who are ready to rise up and fight back. I see a room of females who may be caught red-handed, but Jesus says if you have no sin around her, then, then you can throw the first stone. And stones fall all around the king of all kings. 
Because no one else gets to write the banner over your life. No one else gets to say, this is you, this is what you've done, so this is who you're always going to be. A warrior, come on, we know about your past. Heck, I wrote my past in a book to stick it to the enemy. No, I know the Jesus who raises the woman up and says, in response to my great love for you, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Y'all, he calls us to holiness, to purity, not because he is withholding some great thing for you, but because he is fiercely protecting your body, your soul, your spirit, and your heart. He wants you to be a vessel, pure in mind and thought, what we put before our eyes, what we listen to. Y'all are like, I really want purity, but I also love Cardi B. And I'm just like, it's not a balance. It's... (laughs) It's rough. Okay, there's some seventh graders who are like, who's Cardi B? Do not go look that up. That was a mistake on my part. The point is, God is desiring an army of women to rise up in purity. An army of women who in response to a hashtag Me Too world that's hurting that's broken, that needs to know truth, that wants to know answers, and are looking around for any source of steadiness and steadfastness and any source of hope and healing, would it be a world that could look at you, you, this generation as a whole, but would it be your classmates that could turn and look at you and see someone who is walking in strength, in purity, in resolve, in focus, in redemption, no matter what your backstory looks like. A woman who is walking carried differently because you've met the king of all kings and you've tasted living water. And y'all, let me just tell you, once you've tasted living water, the rest tastes like sewage. Can I just tell you, my husband... compared to every other guy I cross paths with, is a man amongst boys, a man with a heart seeking after God, a man who champions me on and sees what God is doing in my heart and my life, a man who looked at my past and took a knee for my future. Poetic, I know. When he proposed, you get it. A man who knows who God is, knows what God says about me, leads us, is humble, kind, gentle, so fine. He's just a package. I look at the other guys I was involved with and I'm like, peasants, what was I thinking? What was I doing? How short do we sell the goodness and the glory of God when we want to choose for ourselves what's best for us? Nothing I ever even attempted measured up to the man that God had in store. But I found that man that God had in store after coming to know Christ myself, after having him search and purify my heart, after throwing off the sin that so easily entangled me, after moving towards understanding, after allowing my full heart, my whole mind, my whole spirit, my whole all of my strength to focus on the king of all kings to be made completely full and content in the goodness and glory of God. And I entered into an intimacy fast. I called it kiss list till next Christmas. Brilliant. And I went on for two years of isolation. Some of us in this room are terrified to be alone. And you're not alone when you're walking hand in hand with the king of all kings. Two years of Focus on intimacy with God, learning who he said I was, learning what he had for me. The next man I met, I'm not saying this is a surefire recipe, but in my story, the next man I met was Jeremiah. And yes, he's smoking hot, but I also had eyes to see his character in his heart because he was undistracted. He wasn't a piece I needed to feel complete. He was like a cherry on top. Because my completion, my contentment, my wholeness, my security, my identity, my worth, my beauty was all found solely in Christ. And that is how we must be, ladies. Full, complete, content. 
Repenting of sexual sin is a part of our story or has been. Repenting isn't just asking forgiveness and then, oh my goodness, I found myself in front of my computer again and I'm doing nothing to help the problem. No, repentance is seeking forgiveness and the definition is turning away from sin. Turning away. The cry of my heart, my prayer became after coming to know Christ, it was, God, break my heart for what breaks yours and bind my heart to thee. Give me eyes to see the world as you do and give me ears to hear the cries of the hurting. Make me more like Jesus. Make me more like you. And a few months later, when that temptation for sexual sin crept back in, after Christ, I'll never forget opening the computer screen, and clicking to a familiar site, and the first time a sexually perverse image came up on the screen, I almost threw up. I was nauseated. Immediately, it was like, I suddenly saw this woman as someone's daughter, as, as potentially a mother, as a sister, as a friend. It rehumanized my understanding of what I was watching, and I slammed the computer shut, and my heart was pounding, and I remembered I didn't even realize this was applying to my sexual sin, but my prayer had been, God, that you would break my heart for what breaks yours, and my heart is about to rip out of my chest. Gave me new eyes to see every single guy around me except one is just a friend or a brother in Christ. Hopefully if one comes for marriage. Gave me new understanding of my worth and my value that didn't have to be prostituted out to feel like I was something. Oh no, he said you're everything. And take the cross at Calvary so you would have to go seek ninth grade Johnny to know that you were loved. And it die and stay. On, someone just shuffled like, how does she know Johnny? Does everyone know Johnny? I don't know Johnny. I am pulling names out of a hat party, people. But if the spirit of the Lord is convicting you, then Johnny has got to go. I've never liked him. He's, oh, there really is a Johnny. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but tell him I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all, we have got to be women. <laughs> we've got to be warriors, and we've got to be women who fight like hell against the enemy because he will try as best he can to drag you off the cliff. A, sheep in, a wolf in sheep's clothing selling you lies, twisting things, cheapening things, perverting things. Oh, but would we be women of discernment and wisdom, of resolve, of steadfast hope, with our eyes set on the king of all kings and who he says we are? Would we be women who understand it's not just behavior modification, it's heart transformation? Would we be women who want to live pure, God-honoring lives? Because you may be, this is a taboo quote, everyone says it, but it's so good, you may be the only Bible that somebody is reading. People are reading your life. What, what narrative are you telling them? Are you pointing to the goodness and the glory of a God who wants to, to resurrect and transform their lives as well? I care about this stuff because it goes so far beyond the church, do this, don't do that. Sure, we want to do this that honors God. We want to avoid that that is like a bear trap around our ankle, of course. But the deeper root of the heart is that we need to know whose we are. And we need to trust and ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, to teach us, to, again, to guide us, to convict us. I kind of wanted to open up the floor for Q&A, but I know y'all's teachers aren't going to have any of that. We don't have time! I didn't write the itinerary! Uh, this is not my call to make. You, you can keep going. <laughs> okay. We'll go over like five more minutes and then y'all really do have to go to class. I would love to open the floor. Um, I, I don't want to miss praying over this because this is like a war cry for our generation. But I'd love to open the floor for a few questions because I know always in this conversation some pop up and um, can I really keep going? Did you say that on the microphone? Okay. 
some pop up and, and we end up a little more confused than we are helped. So I would love to just kind of field a few questions if you guys have them. And while you're thinking real quick, y'all, the other day I gave this message and I was supposed to water it down for middle schoolers. A real challenge. I am so proud of the seventh and eighth graders who are in here who have been like so attentive. Y'all are amazing. But I had to give this talk for a group of middle schoolers who were like primary sixth grade, like straight out of elementary school. So I'm like figuring out how to fashion these words and how to tailor them just right. And I'm thinking up here like, spirit of the living God, I am changing their lives. This is amazing. They're retaining this stuff. They're going to know this from literal fifth grade age. And then I opened up the floor for Q&A. I mean, they were like dialed in the whole time I was talking. Then I was like, I really feel like we could do Q&A. What do you guys want to know? And their hands shot up. And I'm like, profound, Lord. And I'm like, yes. And this girl goes, what is your favorite shape? It's like, what? A triangle. I don't know. What else do you guys have for me? And this other girl's hand earnestly shot up. And I'm like, okay, this is like a seventh grader, eighth grader. It's going to be a good one. And she was like, favorite color? I'm like, okay, we're not, we're not doing Q&A. Um, but it is a good question. Triangle, the trinity. So I'll go with that one. Um, I don't know. But do any of you guys have any deep, amazing questions? Or fun questions? I'm totally an open book. I feel like a teal, like maybe a mint, a little darker than mint. Okay. Yes. Oh, I don't want to stand up. Okay. Um, how, because I'm a very control freak, and like I've heard from a lot of people that it's a real problem with everything I do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how, what are some things that can help me like get over that? Because it, it controls my life and what I do. Yeah, that's a great question. So she's, she's asking around struggles with control, and that plagued my story, especially through middle school and high school. And ultimately, what God began to open my eyes to and what I would pray he begins to reveal to you too of who is truly in control, big picture. There's a great benefit to self-control, to being wise, to be discerning, to walking in a sense of self-control to be honoring. But y'all, it teeters on, on like idol worship when we make controlling things what we're really worshiping and following. We need to know every detail, everything, how it's going to play out, how we can do this, how we can do that. Because what ultimately grows out of that is if we are feel like we need to be in complete control and we're successful, we take complete glory and victory and praise for it. And if we feel like we need to be in complete control and it fails or there is disaster or something occurs out of our control, we marry that to our identity of I am a failure. I couldn't control this. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I wasn't smart enough. We carry the weight of the world on our back when we are so desperately trying to control everything around us. But scripture says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so what the beauty of stepping into the invitation of surrendering control, of saying, God, I've got my brain here, I've got my hands and feet, I know you've given them to me to be about good productive work. But ultimately, Lord, this outcome is yours to determine. And I know who I am if it succeeds, and I know who I am if it fails. And I know who you are in the midst of it all. And like scripture says, I know that you are using all for your glory. So whether it looks bleak or whether it looks incredible, I have my eyes set on you. And I know that you're unchanging. And even if a storm comes or a death comes or a divorce comes or whatever may happen, if we surrender control, we can accept the fact and be decided about whose we are and who we will be before the storm even hits. Does that make sense? I think releasing control is actually the beauty of the Christian walk. It's understanding how finite we are and how immeasurably grand he is. And the beauty of the cross is that it grants us access by the power of the Holy Spirit to commune with God, to know him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to have a teach us and convict us. And so we can trust him too in that relationship, in prayer and fasting and petitioning God. We can see what he has for us. Jeremiah 33, 3, ask me and I will tell you remarkable things you do not know of what's to come. Man, how much more exciting of a walk is that as a Christian when we're trusting him 
And he says there are remarkable things to come. I imagine they would greatly outweigh the certain things that we want or that we think we need.